Look at those beautiful needles. Oh, what are you doing to Steven today? Oh, hey, Mal. This Hi. is it's a quenched sample. You know how when you quench a piece of steel, it gets really hard, right? Yeah. That's because it's actually forming these crystals, these grains, uh, in a microstructure that we call martensite. You can see all the cool little needles throughout there, making these very, very, very tight sort of fine grains uh, from the quenching process as it cools so quickly that any carbon in the steel ends up getting totally trapped. That trapped carbon kind of stretches out your body center cubic structure so that the steel itself can't even move anymore. The atoms are totally locked up, making it super strong and uh, somewhat brittle, but still good for making things like you know, tools, files, drive shafts, swords, oh. even armor plating. Uh, strength is really, really nice in some ways. So what if you don't quench it then? Uh, yeah, if you cool a little slower, something else is gonna happen. Let me just switch over here to uh, <clears throat> an annealed material instead. Annealed means it's been slowly cooled in the furnace. So rather than quickly cooling it in water like the last sample was, this one was very, very slowly cooled. And even when we're zoomed out here, you can start to, start to see the difference between these two samples. If I zoom into the same level that we were at a second ago, we can start to see the real difference in these structures here. Oh yeah. So right off the bat, you can see that like our crystals are much, much larger with the slower cooling rate, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so each individual crystal is just significantly bigger, which does have some effect on properties. But the biggest effect is these sort of striped kind of crystals. You can see those sort of lines in there, almost like little zebra stripes moving across. Yeah. This is a special kind of phase called perlite, which is what happens to... Uh, Perlite looks like a zebra, eh? Yeah, just like your layers of carbon, iron carbide. Exactly. We've got the layers of carbon and iron carbide forming here within the grain of perlite, which is what happens when we slowly cool our steel. Yeah. Um, the ferrite, that's this white region here, it has no carbon at all in it. It sort of was the first thing to solidify, dumping the carbon out to be formed into these guys. So, so we end up with this uh, ferrite perlite kind of combo, which is really typical for a slower cooled steel. Even something like air cooling will typically form this kind of structure, making for a more ductile, soft kind of structure. Yeah. Which is really good for things like structural steels, pipeline steels, uh, your car door, for example. Anything that needs to be like deformed and maintain a little bit of toughness and crack resistance when it's actually in its final state. Okay. So what is the, how can you identify it? But what kind of tests you can identify the difference? Hardness is one of the big ones. The Martin site that we looked at a second ago would be much, much harder than this one. Um, but what I was actually trying to compare here was the speed with which we actually have to quench something to form Martin site. Say I'm welding, for example. If I weld my material, I'm probably welding something like a structural steel in most cases. I don't want Martin site to form. I don't want my material to be less tough or more brittle than it would be otherwise, right? And so when I'm welding, I want to make sure that I form ferrite. I want to know how fast I can cool my weld while still being safe. Because if I cool any faster than that, martensite might form and then I'm in trouble. Figuring out where that cooling rate is, is where something called the Jomini test actually comes into play. So cooling rate means like if you quench it in water, would be fast cooling, and if you just leave it in the furnace, would be a slow cooling, is that what it means? That's the idea, but even cooling in air probably qualifies as slow. Cooling in oil might be a little slower than water, but still quite quick. Does martensite form when we quench it in oil? Probably for most steels, but not necessarily for all of them. There's some differences there that we should talk about. Okay, sounds good. So what are you gonna do now? Let's do some Jomini testing. Here's my Jomini bar. This is a four inch long bar, one inch in diameter. This, is, this particular piece is made of AISI 1040 steel, plain carbon steel, 0.4% carbon, so like a pretty basic medium carbon steel that we're gonna test here today. Uh, the idea is that I'm gonna put this into the furnace here at 1550 degrees Fahrenheit, so that's uh, 843 degrees Celsius. It's a nice bright red hot that we're gonna bring it up to. And once I get it up to that temperature, all of the carbon should be dissolved in here. It should fully form into austenite, if you know what that means. Dissolving all the carbon and allowing me to quench it to form that martensite, or slow cool it to form the ferrite that we looked at a second ago, too. The idea is I'm going to take this bar and then just quench it from the bottom. 
And as I quench it just from the bottom here, the part where the water is in contact with should form martensite, I guess. But is it gonna form martensite up here? Probably not, right? Because this whole region is just air cooled, basically. It should be forming ferrite. The real question is, where does the martensite start? Do I form martensite here? Maybe. Do I form martensite here? Maybe. Depends how deep that martensite goes. That's gonna tell me how easy it is to form martensite. How fast a cooling rate do I need to form martensite? So let's start by heating it up and then we'll put it into the Germany tester. Leave it there for half an hour, make sure the changes fully take place, and then we'll give it a quench. Simple little unit here is the Jomini and quench machine. We basically just got one main control, which is on or off, turning on the jet. You can control how high that jet goes, but if you see on the inside here, there's a jet of water down at the bottom that's going to be quenching my sample right after we drop the sample down in here. Let's do it. The sample has been sitting in the furnace for half an hour now. It's nice and hot. And we're just going to quickly take it over here and drop it in place. So you can see the whole disc sort of so slowly moving up as the red hotness is uh, leaving the sample. The bottom is quenched very, very quickly, but the top is still very hot, essentially being air cooled. Let's take a look at the thermal camera. Thermal camera doesn't really show a whole heck of a lot. It shows our sample still being extremely hot, and down below, you don't really hardly see anything because, well, it's not hot anymore. The bottom of the sample is essentially already down to the temperature of the water. So we've ground one surface down flat here. So we'll be testing from the quenched end and doing a series of hardness indents along that flat portion there. Just gotta grind the back side to make it flat too to have a nice flat stage. So there's a standard for Domini testing, ASTM A255. And according to that standard, we're going to test hardness every 16th of an inch for the first inch, and then slightly more spaced out after that. So all I'm doing here is just marking those individual points I'm not going to worry about being too perfectly accurate here for the purposes of this video, but we can get our indents there every sixteenth of an inch. The machine here is set up for Rockwell C. We've got a conical indenter, 150 kilogram load, and so I'm just going to be placing our piece here and testing it from the quenched end inward. This first indent should give us a high hardness reading, since this is probably made of martensite. The indenter goes in and then measures how far back it comes out to measure the hardness. And looks like we're sitting at 58.2 HRC for our first indent. So, hard. This is a pretty typical martensite hardness for this carbon content. I expect that for the first couple of indents here, we'll continue seeing martensite, and then that martensite will start to fall off as we move away from the quenched end. We're getting slower and slower cooling rates, already down to 52.9. 41.6. Now we're properly dropping off. 
and it's going to continue to drop as the percentage of martensite decreases. So now we aren't dealing with 100% martensite anymore. We have a mixed microstructure of martensite and probably some ferrite in there as well. And now we're getting 29.5, significantly lower, maybe getting close to the point where we have almost no martensite present. So Paradise is around 20 SRC, if I'm not mistaken. 20 something, depends on your carbon content. Yeah. 28.5. And now that we've sort of reached this high 20s, our hardnesses probably are going to be more or less consistent. Our material now is 100% ferrite and perlite, 28.2. And as I continue through the test, probably our hardness won't change very much at all because we're already forming 100% ferrite and perlite here. What is the final number? That's our final number at 15.7 HRC. And so you can see our series of hardness indents there, 1 16th of an inch for the first inch, a little more spaced out for the next inch after that. But it gave us plenty of data that we should be able to put into a hardenability curve. So we took our 22 indents total and we graphed them into what we call a hardenability curve. So on our x-axis here, we've got our distance from our quenched end in 1 16th of an inch. The first 16th, our first measurement was a very high hardness, stayed high for a while, but then very quickly dropped off, right? Leading me to believe that these first three indents were mostly martensite, but once we're down here, we probably have no martensite left at all. That tells us that our 4140 steel actually cool, uh, uh, forms martensite only at quite high cooling rates, right? Only when we're quite close to the quenched end do we form martensite after around five sixteenths of an inch, give or take, we're pretty much 100% ferrite already. So I would say that 1040 steel is not very hardenable. Hardenability is kind of a measure of how easy something forms martensite, and 1040 steel forms martensite when cooled quickly, but if you cool it a little more slowly, it doesn't form martensite that easily. So maybe this material will be relatively easy to weld. Maybe I could weld it without too much uh, preheat or other work to slow the cooling rate down because martensite does form only at those faster cooling rates. That idea of hardenability is an important one, how easy it is to form martensite. And we can put some numbers to that with the Jomini test here as well. If we look at ASDM A255, the Jomini test standard, it tells us that uh, at a hardness of about 43 HRC is where about 50% martensite should exist. We bring that down to figure out the distance, and we can tell that a Jomini distance here is going to be about 3.9 sixteenths of an inch, equivalent to 0.24 inches. So one quarter of an inch from the bottom was still forming half martensite, but anything beyond that was less than half, right? If you want some other ways to put numbers to that, we can say that that 3.9 sixteenths is equivalent to a cooling rate of 70 degrees Celsius per minute or an ideal critical diameter of 1.72 inches, if you know what that means. These are just different ways to sort of put numbers to hardenability. But the idea here is that we can sort of assess how easy it is to form that hard structure, how easy it is to form martensite, and therefore how easy it is to weld. So what have we learned so far? I guess we learned that 1040 steel is relatively easy to weld, might need some kind of uh, procedure to put in place to slow the cooling rate a bit but it won't be as dangerous as something that's a little higher alloy or higher, higher carbon content, which would allow our material to form martensite much easier and therefore be a little more dangerous as far as welding goes. Awesome. Thank you, Steven. All right. See you in the next video. See you. So finally, I honestly didn't get that. What is hardness? What is hardenability? What's the difference? You were supposed Isn't to tell us. from the graph? No, it wasn't. So, okay. Uh, high hardness means that it's literally hard, like abrasion resistant and strong. Uh, low hardness means that it's soft and probably ductile in most cases. So that's hardness. Hardness is just literally how hard it is. Uh, hardenability, on the other hand, is related to hardness, 
only because it tells us how easy it is to actually harden that piece of steel. How easy is it to form martensite? I don't care how hard the martensite is, I don't care what hardness and measurements exactly. All I care about is where the change is happening, from that high hardness at the beginning, where we quenched it, down to the low hardness where we finished off, and how quick a cooling rate is needed to form that martensite. So you're saying hardness is ability of material to resist plastic deformation? Sure. And the hardenability is ability of material to produce martensite. Exactly. Which relates, because martensite is hard to form, Yeah. but a distinct kind of thing, yeah. Very hard. good. Yeah.